Hi, everybody. Oh, wow. Hi, I'm first. Always nerve wracking. So I'm Becca from Dark and Stop Shelf. I have a question for you. First of all, I love the character. Jennifer earlier spoke of Crossroads for this season. So I have to ask, and I've been wondering, is this something Omega will tackle personally as in Crossroads? Like the growth level, leaving adolescence be behind, you know, childish things behind. And how will that affect her? And that said, what's the difference between her now in this season versus where we left her behind in season one? Thanks, Becca. I think you've sort of hit the nail on the head. Um, we have a we have a time jump and, you know, in season one, she was very much a naive youth. She'd never left Camino. So the physical wonder of, you know, being on different planets and, and the, the physical world was sort of what really amazed her. I think what we kind of move into for season two for Omega is this awareness of, um, of deeper themes of um you know of politics of meeting communities and people who who have a a lifestyle that feels intrinsically unjust or unfair to her and sort of invest she starts to investigate that um we also have you know mentors that she comes across who have different different views about like what the mercenary life means and i think overall it's this idea of identity like who who is she? Who are the batch? And how do they choose to, now that they're free, how do they choose to spend their existence? And can they add, can they and should they advocate for a cause? Or do they have a right just to exist and and enjoy life and and not, you know, not be on missions, either their own or someone else's? Thank you. Hey, hey there, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. I am Richard, and this is Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland. And we would love to know about your performance as Omega. Can you take us through the process of aging up Omega for season two with your vocal performance? Oh, thank you. Um, that's an interesting question. So uh, it's more that obviously for season one, um, I had to work much harder to sound younger. Uh, season two is is almost in some ways easier to be a little bit older because it's closer to my to my own natural state um and it's really just like I sort of said the 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 childlike wonder um is tampered down a bit and season two I feel is a little bit emotionally darker and more challenging so I think um just because of the emotional stakes that we see Omega go through uh the, the viewers and my performance was sort of yeah, it was it was really easy to lean into like making her feel a little bit older because of the emotional stakes that um that our story takes her through this season. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Trisha Barr from Fangirls Going Rogue. Um, we've followed the animation process for a long time, and I know that every show is a little different. What's the recording like? Who's in the room with you when you're recording, and how does that go? <laughs> Hi, Trisha. That's a really fun question. I actually, I'm in New Zealand. I record in New Zealand, literally uh, in my little studio in my house. So I am 100% by myself. Um, and I, I get to zoom into LA and San Francisco. Our team is kind of spread between those two places. And I'm not 100% sure of the animation process because a lot of the times when we do our record, I'm just, uh, I just have a script and a director and and possibly my co my co stars, my co my, my co actor voice, my co voice actors. Um, but then when we do pickups, the animation and the uh, recording process has converged a little bit more. So it's always exciting on pickup record because we get a little glimpse of the animatics, often you know nowhere near finished. Um, but that's when you really sort of see the direction and the the mind's eye of the director bringing the vocal performance and layering it with, um, you know, the animation beats. But but really, in terms of what I do, I, I kind of work solely in the audio space until the very, very end. But they also record me, I think. they they have I have to record my face and it's weird. Sometimes it's 6 a.m. in the morning and, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I pity the person who has to watch this video. But I think sometimes they... Um, might might take some of my mannerisms and work that into their um, ideas for Omega. Hey, I've got sort of a two part question. I'm wondering how the uh, the Bad Batch have influenced Omega as she's moving into season two, but also like in a real world uh, situation, like how has D. Bradley Baker 
uh, influenced or mentored you as a, a voice actor uh, uh, in parallel with that? Cool. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, obviously the Bad Batch brothers, I think we are, I'd like to think that Amiga and her brothers are on a more even playing field. I think you'll really sense that. It's not like she is trying to ingratiate herself to them anymore. And in some instances, uh, we see that she has potentially a better insight into a situation, perhaps, than her experienced brothers. Um, what I love about season two is that we'll get to explore more specific dynamics between Omega and each of her brothers, the individual personalities of them and how Omega interacts with that is, is quite special. And, you know, I mean, obviously Hunter and Rekka had really wonderful um arcs in season one but but you know echo and Ted, we just get a we get a deeper sense of how Omega interacts with each of her brothers and then with D um I'm sure you guys all know he's an incredible actor and very experienced and also incredibly generous the fact that we live in different countries means that we don't often get to physically connect but um you know we got to meet in celebration I think for the second time in person <laughs> And um, he was he was there then and he was, you know, very generous. And mostly I think uh, he's a shining beacon for how to, you know, he, he loves his job and he loves all of you guys and the fan base. And I think I was a little bit nervous because I haven't really been a part of uh, a big family like this. And he was just a very reassuring friend. And um, I, I, I ask him for most of the advice he gives me is sort of just how to calm my nerves before doing things like this or like how to how to navigate my way through um through press stuff because uh yeah I that that stuff is completely new to me. <laughs> Hi Michelle. First of all, I just want to say that you're doing a fabulous job with the press and with all of us, with all of us fans. So thank you very much for that and keep up the great work. Um I wanted to ask you about your new costume. You've got a brand new costume. You finally got rid of those pajamas, and and <laughs> how did that feel? And and can you talk us through when you first saw that costume and how you felt about you know your new your your new hat as well? Just talk us through that process if you can. Thanks, James. Thanks for being so reassuring. That's kind of you. Um, yeah. So I, you know, we often we only get the scripts like literally a couple of days before we record. Um, but Brad, our director, had prefaced that there would be a, a change. I think I probably only saw the new outfit. Yeah, maybe maybe during pickups of like the first episode. So it would have I would have done the recording before I understood exactly the new visual. But it makes sense, right? She's <laughs> she's she's getting she's growing up. pretty dangerous. Yeah, she's growing up. I feel like it's uh, sensible to have uh, have a little bit more protection. And I think it's really just this visual indicator, like I mentioned, that she is absolutely comfortable and competent in this batch, in the squad. Mm -hmm. And um, is her love for adventure and missions. And she sort of wears it as comfortably as she would wear her Camino pajamas. So it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a bulky, it's not a bulky un unusual thing for her I think you know we see her move in it and um it feels like it, it belongs to her so it's sort of cementing her her identity in the squad as as someone who's ready for action um and yeah I, I was excited to see like her having a little bit of longer hair and the helmet I, she just looks she looks older to me you know uh, in, a, in a in a way that makes sense because of you know the, the missions that they're now going on thank you thanks Hi, Michelle. I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So nice to talk to you today. Um, my question is one of my favorite parts of season one was uh, the relationship between Omega and Crosshair, actually. And I loved how Omega had hope for Crosshair at different points in season one. Do you think she still has hope for him throughout season two? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Omega has you know is very aware of each of her brothers and as much as crosshair and the batch are now in you know their paths their story paths are quite separate I, I have no doubt that Amiga absolutely thinks of him as family and um there's like Amiga has a very sort of clear mission in terms of what she what she wants her family to look and feel like. So Crosshair is not someone that Omega will have forgotten about at all. So, <laughs> yeah. So we have a question about Omega's role in the Bad Batch. So 
as much as it is a story about the dismantling of the clones by the Empire, it's also more of a coming-of-age story about Omega. And now that she's older and wiser, how does she feel about her role in the team and what's she learning about herself and her <laughs> Force-sensitive abilities? <laughs> um, well, to, to the second thing, I don't think... She, she doesn't think of herself as, as that at all. Uh, she is a, a curious and empathetic soul. And I think what um what is dawning for Omega throughout season two is how how passionate and aware she is that her and her brothers especially I think in in the first half of the season um how there isn't really much advocating for them as their own race or you know beings in their own right they're sort of very much considered um, assets or pawns that have been commandeered by various groups and so it's really interesting to see Omega because she has a strong sense of identity of family of the fact that all the clones are her brothers but also because she's so naive to politics and war she has this very pure and unbridled passion to to ensure that they as a as a race are protected and heard and valued and I think we'll really get to see what that means to her and how she can apply herself to protecting her family. Omega made such a huge impact during season one people totally fell in love with her so coming into season two where do you stand with first your relationship to an older more savvy Omega and second the fandom who have taken you into their hearts in such a strong way? An older and more savvy Omega, well, it, it just, I think I mentioned before that season two has some sort of darker and more um, it themes that are, that potentially have high, like quite high stakes. And it was really delicious, especially as an actor and voice actor to play out scenes or interactions that um, emotionally went to, to scarier, deeper, more unsettled places. Um, so as a creative, I really enjoyed giving that sort of extra emotional dimension to Omega and being allowed to um, have very, yeah, emotional scenes. And in terms of the fandom, I am, like I mentioned, I still get a little bit nervous. It just feels so big. But after having met many of you at Celebration this year, which was my first convention, um, it's it's just so heartwarming. I. I love under, understanding like how much Star Wars has been a part of not just like an individual, but potentially, you know, like their family. It seems very intergenerational. Um, it also, you know, across genders. And I, I one thing that blew me away um, at Celebration was just this like unbridled sense of indiv acceptance of everyone's individual entry into Star Wars. So um, as someone like who's new, I just feel like even though I'm new, I feel yeah, everyone's been very generous and kind, and um, it's, it's, it's a good it's a good community to be a part of. So thank you. Hi, uh, Mark from Tarkin's Top Shelf. D. Bradley Baker has been the one man clone show for a decade and a half now, which is hard to believe. Uh, so how did you approach an established character type that he has inhabited for so long, and create a new character that is a unique individual in her own right? Uh, and how did you find a way to play that character that showed the right balance of innocence and intelligence? Uh, thanks. Gosh, I had no idea that it was actually that long, but it's not surprising. He is incredibly like comfortable and fluid in, in finding different voices for essentially the same character. Um, as for myself, I think the just the fact that Omega is a young girl clone um, did liberate me quite a lot from having to sort of like pick up um where d had had created um i also have the added lucky bonus that i am naturally gifted with the new zealand accent so i think i didn't have to work quite as hard as d is like getting the accent right um and in terms of innocence and, and intelligence, I, I have to just take my hat off to the writers. I think the the writing in Bad Batch is extremely well considered. They're also very generous as well. Um, if you know, when we're doing a record, if something, if a line, if a line sort of comes across too adult, it sort of is immediately apparent. You know, when I'm reading, I'm like, I, just, I feel like she wouldn't have, she wouldn't describe the feeling in this way, or this word feels 
feels perhaps too mature for her to use. Those kinds of things um, sometimes come up in recordings and our writer, um, well, Jen, our head writer, is often on the recording. So they're very generous in being able to work with me to find something that fits better. Um, but really, it's just the the deliciousness of voice acting where they create a story and a scene and a world. And then when I record it, I imagine that I'm there. And yeah, I guess just the, the natural instinct for how I would how I would say something with, with my imagination coupled together comes that that's what breathes life into Amiga. And I'm glad that you think that it's working. <laughs> yeah, definitely is. Thank you very much. All right, Sarah and Richard, you have time for another question. Oh, great. How would Omega, in her own voice and her point of view, how would she describe season two using the Omega voice? Um, good question. I think from her point of view, it would be like if there was a catch for it, it would be like, don't worry about, don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. Let's do this for our family. I think she has without giving away any spoilers, um, she has this incredible bravery in the face of something that will literally rip apart their family. And she is not fearful because she knows that she wants to contribute to to the greater cause. Excellent. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. <laughs> you. Great answer. Hey, look at those names to the left. They are part of the Skywalking Force, our Patreon. Become a producer yourself and check out all the Disney Plus themed bonus content available depending on the level you subscribe. Become a member of the Elite Skywalking Force at skywalkingforce.com. <laughs>